so excited to welcome you to this Meet the Managers event by VC Lab. Uh, let me introduce myself. Let me introduce VC Lab. We'll give everyone a moment to stream in, and then we'll get started with the exciting discussion that we have for you today. So my name is Adeo Ressi. I'm CEO of VC Lab. I'm also executive chairman of the Founder Institute. So I've been working in the startup ecosystem for over two decades, and I just know a lot of stuff about a lot of things. Really excited to have everyone here today and meet some amazing new venture capitalists from all around the world. Um, VC Lab, which is hosting this event, is a accelerator for venture capital firms. So we take in managers from all around the world. Uh, we took in about 200 firms in cohort uh, six, which is midway through right now, and we're recruiting for cohort seven. And we put them through a four month intensive process to launch and close a venture capital fund. So a lot of people start the program with an idea for a venture capital fund. Uh, and then by four months later, they're in a position to call capital and start investing. Now, sometimes it takes five months, sometimes it takes six months. The average time for a participant in VC Lab to close a fund is about five months from the beginning of the program. And this next cohort, cohort seven, is going to start in June. Uh, we're going to co conclude enrollment in May, so in a couple weeks from now. And the goal is that everyone in cohort seven will have a fund operational by the end of 2022. So the summer is a pretty difficult fundraising time. So what will happen is you'll, you'll do a lot of legwork on your venture capital firm and your, on your venture capital fund over the summer when fundraising is difficult. And then you're gonna come into late summer and early fall and really pick up fundraising in cohort seven so that you could close in October or November of 2022 and you will have a vintage 2022 fund. Now I see lots of people are um, coming in, which is great. Uh, so hopefully you heard a little bit about VC Lab. Let me talk a little bit about the event today and then we'll get started. So first and foremost, there's a chat uh, down at the bottom. You can please share uh, your LinkedIn details, introduce yourself, do all sorts of chatting in the chat, meet all the people that will be here. We had over 400 people register for the event today. My guess is uh, in a few minutes, we'll have well over 100. These are amazing people, limited partners, general partners from all around the world. Use the chat to introduce yourself, talk with them, meet new friends, meet new acquaintances, et cetera. There's also a Q&A button. If you have questions for me or any of the um, amazing panelists that we'll get to introducing in one moment, you can post it in the Q&A. There's a thumbs up button in the Q&A as well. And we're gonna get your questions on screen uh, for sure during this. So make sure to ask them in the Q&A and upvote them. And we'll go through the upvoted questions uh, first and then the rest of the questions later. So if you have questions for anyone, put in the Q&A, not in the chat. Okay, so the event today is called Meet the Managers, all right? This is one of my favorite events because you're going to meet some of my favorite people, which are managers uh, who uh, recently completed uh, VC Lab Cohort 5. These managers hail from all different backgrounds and have a lot of exciting things to share. And they're going to talk to you about their experiences um, really going through the VC Lab program and, and working to launch a venture capital uh, fun. And so you're going to get firsthand insights on what it's like to launch a fund, what it's like to go through VC Lab, etc. So without further ado, we're going to do uh, 
introductions and rather than me introduce them which is you heard enough of me talking we'll go in order we'll do Oren, Pankaj, Matt, Sriram and Pablos and we're gonna start with Oren first and then just keep going around. Oren take a moment and introduce yourself. Thank you good morning uh, Adeo and first thank you thank you for hosting this and thank you to VC Lab I think we're all pretty excited to be here and to have been through the program which was really spectacular. Uh, so my name is Oren Aloni Cheris. Uh, my origin story briefly is that I'm actually a doctor and anesthesiologist and I've been in practice for 30 years, now retired and full-time involved in venture and innovation. And I was um, exposed to venture capital early in my medical career uh, and found it to be really fascinating and important. And in medicine in particular, we are awash in innovation and venture capital is really one of the most important drivers of innovation in healthcare. Uh, I'm based in San Francisco and uh, we uh, are really excited to be here. Hey, Adeo, thanks so much for doing this. Um... I'm Pankaj, and you know I uh, spent most of my career, uh, or, or early part of my career in finance, uh, Wall Street, um, mostly in technology and operations, and that kind of led me to becoming uh, an entrepreneur. And I moved to India in 2007 and uh, started a company. It didn't go so well, but got involved with a whole bunch of other things, and uh, uh, been a VC for a couple of years. Uh, been angel investing for quite a while and uh, love to roll up my sleeves and help uh, entrepreneurs that are looking at SaaS, enterprise, and analytics types of companies. Uh, thank you, Adeo, for the invite. So I'm Matt Gunter. I'm based in Mexico and predominantly working with Latin American companies, uh, supporting them in their journey to success. So we've been working with startups and investors for the past seven years, uh, past five years also in VC. And in 2019, co-founded Lotux with the aim to really invest in pre-seed companies in the region and help them grow. All right, next. Uh, hey, Areo, thank you for having me here and uh, thanks to VC Lab. Uh, my name is Sri Ram. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm based out of San Francisco. I'm actually San Jose, actually. Um, I've been involved in the startup ecosystem for over 15 years as a mentor, as an advisor, as an entrepreneur. Uh, in 2020, I co-founded my latest startup, Hyperstack, in the blockchain space. I'm very passionate about uh, SaaS uh, and uh, uh, being born and uh, you know brought up in India, I actually like have the opportunity to go back and during that time I met with a lot of founders who uh, inspired me uh, a lot to actually explore the space. And uh, you know I I have built a startup ecosystem that connects Indian entrepreneurs to the U.S. market. Uh, SaaS has a big market here. If anyone of you is interested to learn more, you know, and want to connect with me, please feel free to do so. Really excited to be here and share my experience, you know, as a VC. Thank you. Hi, guys. I'm Pablos. I'm a hacker and an inventor who worked on a lot of deep tech projects in my career. I helped start Blue Origin, which is a spaceship company. And then I built a lab with Nathan Mirvold to do uh, a lot of deep tech invention projects and start new technologies. And so my whole career has been working on advancing new technologies that can solve big problems in the world. And so uh, we have a, a new venture firm that backs startups doing just that kind of stuff. And so um, if you know any mad scientists with crazy hair and a DeLorean in the garage, send them my way. Sorry, I was muted. Does the DeLorean need to take garbage to tra time travel? Is that like a pre I, I mean, if you have one that can do fusion out of uh, some garbage, I would love that. But, you know, we'll, we'll take what we can get to start. So let's re reverse the order a little bit. And again, if you have questions for everyone, pop it in the Q&A. But I have a question for all of you, which is, and we'll start, we'll reverse it. So we'll start with you, Pablos. But, but you know, Besides finding the DeLorean that eats trash and takes you to the future, what inspired you 
to explore venture capital as a career? And, and we'll go in reverse order this time. Yeah, sure. I started a lot of companies. I had a lot of projects that I um, wanted to get off the ground that were technologies that were a little too early for the venture community to internalize and accept. And so a lot of times I had trouble getting support for them over the years. And I also saw that other, you know, uh, venture capital in general was aimed a lot at software. Um, and it wasn't getting to a lot of the technologies that I think are really important. And so to scale them up, we're really going to need to, to uh, get venture capital that is deployed towards deep tech. And I think now is the time to do it. And there's a lot of good reasons for that. But that's what got me going. Awesome. Shiram? Oh, thanks, Adeo. Um, like Pablo's mentioned, uh, I met with a lot of founders from India and uh, uh, I, I kept hearing the same thing, you know, access to capital is so difficult, you know, uh, getting meetings with VCs is difficult. Uh, and having gone through that problem myself, I said, how can I actually make sure I can help, you know, the ecosystem, you know, that exists in India and also like make it a super ecosystem and, and make it more connected. So that inspired me to look at uh, avenues that I could use and Having been a startup mentor and advisor, helping startups with business development and market access in the US, you know, I thought of myself as a bridge and that's what inspired me to actually even start my fund. Matt? Yeah, so um, I was always interested in entrepreneurship. So my father founded a company, I studied small business management. And I mean, I was always one also interested in, uh, I don't know, making the world a better place. So I worked in a charity for a while. So I didn't see that it deals with the underlying problems. And I saw entrepreneurship can be a way to impact people's lives in a positive manner, in a kind of way, just really people helping themselves in the end. So that got me really excited about working with, with the startups, accelerators, investors, and I really wanted to get to the investment side of things um, because that's where I think it's also a lot of action happens. And after working in VC for a while, it was a kind of a natural evolution of just, I really saw a lack of uh, VCs that would help very early stage entrepreneurs and really want to get, let's say, dirty with them, help them to really uh, get to the next level, uh, invest early, be, be a believer and supporter of them. So it was a kind of a natural evolution of, of uh, going to the VC world as well. Don't wait for me to call your name. Oh, gosh. Uh, just, I just unmuted. It. Yeah, no. So <laughs> <in> my, journey, <laughs> my journey was uh, a little uh, accidental and convoluted. You know, I uh, started my career in um, technology and operations on Wall Street. And uh, a lot of the companies that I worked with early on in my career were today, we would classify as fintech companies. But back then, uh, they weren't anything. They were just there. Um, and when I moved to India, I, you know, was doing, um, a startup and at that time I didn't really know anybody across the country and I couldn't hire people easily. It was really tough. Forget about funding. Like just hiring people was really, really difficult at that time. And nobody wanted to work for a startup. Uh, the only people who worked for a startup were folks who couldn't get jobs at, uh, Infosys or Microsoft. Um, and you know, so part of that journey led me to start building communities uh, around entrepreneurship. Uh, and that led me to build a very big network across the country uh, of entrepreneurs. And a couple of folks realized that you know, I had a pretty strong network of entrepreneurs. And um, I got uh, connected with um, the largest media company in India called Times Group, and they were launching an accelerator program and asked me to come on board to help them with uh, deal sourcing, essentially. And that's kind of how I fell into venture capital by mistake. That's awesome. Oren, last but not least, Dr. Gone VC. <laughs> so, well, so, but that's relevant because uh, for me, you know, VC started as just a puzzle to solve. How do you get capital to companies and and make them grow. But what made it really personal for me was when I I found out that one of my friend's children was suffering from a pretty serious illness that, that had a very high mortality. 
and they had exhausted their treatment options. And I was able to go into the network of startups that I created and find a company that was working on a solution that could theoretically help her. That was like a light bulb moment for me because this company was struggling to get capital. They had something that really made sense and could help this young woman and they couldn't get there and they needed help. And, and so for me, that was really the moment that inspired my passion, made me realize we could really help people and make a difference with venture capital. That's a beautiful story. Actually, all were beautiful. Uh, there's someone asking about your laser mosquito thing in the questions, Pablos. Can you apply it to other tech? Did you invent yeah, the, I've actually the seen laser the... that sats the mosquitoes? Oh, geez. This is a, so this guy is an um, entrepreneur who I've, I've actually heard about before. He built a robot pill that you can swallow that yeah, Tori's a, Tori's a good friend of mine who asked Okay, cool. Well, yeah. We have a lot of uh, affinity for robots. Um, yeah, he's referring to an invention I worked on years ago called the photonic fence. And the idea is it finds mosquitoes and then shoots them down with laser beams as a malaria intervention. And that's super fun. It ended up being the kind of thing that, that we thought would eventually become economical because of Moore's Law. It turns out Moore's Law doesn't apply to lasers. So everything about it got cheap except for the laser. And so uh, it's, it works, but it's still too expensive to use the way we want in, in sub-Saharan Africa. But he asked if we could modify it to go after, um, go after ticks. And, um, and ticks are a, like in a beehive. Those are different. Those are a different uh, problem. Our device uses the wing beat frequency to identify the bug. So we can find all the bees and not shoot them, but ticks don't really have a wing beat frequency usually. And so we'd have to use a different mechanism for finding them. But these days it would be pretty easy with- um, You just went super geeky, by the way. Oh yeah, sorry. Okay, anyway, enough Woo! of that. Yeah, so awesome. Let's go save, super geeky. Speaking of questions, you can ask super geeky questions if you want, and you'll probably get super geeky questions like the beat of the wings to, Here's what I recommend on questions. I'm getting like multi-part questions that are like three paragraphs long. No, that's not going to happen. Like a question that I can read relatively easy. One question per question. Also upvote. So I'm going to do a good question that's come in and you upvote by doing the thumbs up. Uh, and, and then I'll get back to some general questions for the panelists in the mo moment. But Mark is asking, any actionable tips on how to de-risk the fundraising process? And I mean, everyone who's raising a fund is fundraising. And I can tell you just as, as a, someone who's seen a lot of it, raising for a venture capital fund is one of the single hardest things you can do. It is certainly the hardest fundraising that you can do. Um, limited partners are not like out there with a website like, hi, pitch me. You have to like dig and find them. So when, when questions come in from the chat, everyone, just, just if you want to raise your hand or indicate and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of let people uh, go as they wish. But does anyone want to take the de-risk the fundraising process question from Mark? Any tips on that? Pankaj, you can go first and then Shiram second. Thanks. Um, yeah, fundraising, I think, for a fund is a lot harder than raising money for a startup. And there's a lot of reasons why. I think the best thing that you can do is, even if you are an experienced investor, having some guardrails. And I think, you know, for me, VC Lab were those guardrails really kind of laying out a map for me and pushing me down a certain stream uh, was really helpful. Um, also start your conversations with folks that are friendly, that could potentially be LPs, but more importantly, could connect you to uh, friendly LPs. Start that process really early, even before you have a fully baked thesis, start talking to your friends uh, and start building that interest and involve them in that process. The more of your friends that get involved in the process, I think really helps them get excited about what you're doing. And a lot of people that may not even be able to write the minimum check size will suddenly raise their hand and say, hey, I really love this journey that you're on. Could I put a small check in? Um, and you know, it opens up a lot of doors. I would say start that conversation really early. And VC Lab is really helpful for me. Yeah, I would. Can I just 
double click on that one second. Sorry, Shiram. Like, if you're thinking to launch a, a venture capital firm or fund, the sooner you start talking to just people that you know and like about it and getting their feedback and seeing if they know anyone, the better. Because those, those type of connections into limited partners could take a few weeks or a few months to cultivate. So the sooner you start, the better. Shiram? Yeah, um, uh, thanks, Arayo. And uh, I second Pankaj on everything that he said. Uh, the, the one thing I would add is, uh, for me personally, from my experience, I can share that if I had actually gone through the whole process of just starting the fund by myself, it would have taken me twice the time that it took, right? So you want to make sure that you are, you know, you have the momentum to close. And this is something that both Adeo and, and Mike, you know, in the early conversations that I had, I remember you mentioned momentum is going to be very important and momentum and fundraising and like making sure you can have your investors lined up is important. I don't want to discount the fact that, you know, even though you raise money, you still got to invest in like valuable assets that are going to give the returns to your investors because when you go and ask money to your investors, and, and like Pankaj said, you know, it's not like you're getting money for a startup. You're actually getting money to invest in assets. And so your investors are going to have these key questions. This is where I think the VC lab program really changed my mindset and made me comfortable with actually asking the hard questions myself. So I'm convinced so I can go and convince my investors. Oren, and then there's another great question from Dan, and then I've got a question for everybody, and then we'll turn it back to questions from, from, from everyone out there. Oren, go. Yes, yeah, so real quickly then, um, I think one of the challenges is that as an emerging manager, you don't necessarily have a track record. And that's going to really be the, I think, the ultimate de-risking is, is the fact that you've done this before and you've had great results. And obviously, if you haven't, you probably shouldn't be doing it again. Um, but as an emerging manager, we don't really have that advantage. And so my recommendation would be that either you look at personal investments and tell a story that you've, you know, around the way you approach these investments and what those returns were like, or you just put together sort of a shadow, you know, a shadow um, portfolio of companies you've looked at that you'd like to invest. And you basically give investors an opportunity to get eyes on how you would approach the investment. We've got a great question from Dan here. Maybe the other panelists could uh, take a stab at it. Um, for any panelists besides fundraising, what's the overall most challenging aspect of building your fund? Thanks. <laughs> like everything, I don't know. Matt, do you wanna go or Pavlos? Yeah, um, awesome. So I think, um, one of the things that I think also BC Lab helped us a lot is just, just generally navigating a lot about the structure of what to do, what not to do, the regulation, what you can say, what you cannot say, how to approach people, how not to approach people. I think that that's uh, also part of, I mean, let's say the general advice that we get. So I think that's also uh, one of the hardest things. And, and I think in the end is also really just um, validating your your thesis so like seeing great opportunities seeing great investment opportunities that will make returns for your investors even though you might be able to convince investors but if you cannot really make returns it's going to be very 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 uh, let's say fast uh, fast fast journey and you are going to finish the career pretty soon so really getting people excited about the thesis, getting really early on with good investments, get some markups and, and yeah, take it from there as well. Can I double click on that? Guys, every minute you spend working on your thesis is valuable because until it's real, and I mean, if anyone disagrees, you can speak up, but it's like, it is really worth investing a lot of time in your thesis, Matt was saying. The other thing he said of do's and don'ts, and I've even seen this happen in the chat right now, okay? General solicitation is illegal or regulated in most of the world. So you can't actually go out there and be like, I'm raising, if you've noticed, no one here has told you the size of their fund or any details because they're not generally soliciting. They're talking about their experiences, blah, blah, blah. 
So I've been seeing people posting in the chat, like my fund size is this, my sector is that. That is not allowed in most places. And if, it, if you want to do it, you have to abide by certain rules and regulations. So just being sensitive to these things, knowing what the rules are, is super important. Pablos? And then I have a question for everybody. I think for me, the, you know, one thing that coming into it that was different is, you know, we have a lot of folks starting funds who have some experience either investing in another context that's, that they can sort of translate that, that to a, a venture capital approach, um, which is, I, mean, I guess that's partly true for me, but that's not really what I'm using to, you know, to build my venture firm on. And so the really important thing for us was, you know, around differentiation for our brand, for what we're doing and really showing how that maps to our experience. And I think a lot of the, what I saw with our cohort in BC Lab is a lot of, a lot of the managers struggled because they, um, they really weren't differentiated enough and that made it harder for them to stand out in their fundraising process. And um, so I think in the, in the and the, this kind of maps back to figure out your thesis. You know, when you're doing that, try to figure out what you are uniquely good at and what you can do well and what's different and what makes you special and what and because you know there's plenty of places, there's plenty of venture funds and BC Labs making sure there's plenty more. So there's plenty of options for LPs um, coming and you know and what you want is to bring them something special. And show them that you're going to get the founders that are going to make a difference, and and so I think that finding a way to do that is really important. And um, and and but just to double down on what everyone else said, like I wouldn't be here without VC Labs' help. It I'd be a third of the way along the, this process that um, because they had so much structure and helped me focus on the things that I should do instead of whatever I imagined in the morning. So that. That's been really helpful. Thank you so much. And I want to double click on what you said. Actually, great segue into my next question, which is if find out what makes you uniquely special, and then that's the basis of your thesis. That's such great advice. And, you know, then no one can copy you. And don't say things that everyone does. Like we do great due diligence, like every fund does great due diligence. We, you know, we thoroughly, you know, we don't, that's not one of our things. <laughs> right. No. Well, no, you know, it's like, I'm assuming that, you know, if, if every VC does something, don't have it in your deck, <laughs> right? It's like, you know, we uh, help our founders uh, grow their company, uh, check, so does everyone else. You know, we do due diligence, check, so does it. Find the things that you do that no one else does and put that in your deck. Okay. Speaking of which, now I want to go and maybe we'll go in order now, Oren, Pankaj, Matt, Shiram, and Pablo Slas, though I, you gave a little hint of that. What, what is making, you know, sort of what is getting you excited about markets or industries right now? What's inspiring you in, in the venture space that you want to talk about? And, you know, you guys come from such different backgrounds. Uh, this is going to be very interesting. So, Oren, why don't we get started with you? So for me, you know, the healthcare market in general is really hot right now. We, you know, uh, fortunate byproduct of the pandemic is that it brought a lot of, you know, it brought a lot of eyeballs and then a lot of capital into the challenges of healthcare. And we've had a lot of major change that normally would take 10, 20 years happen, you know, in, in a matter of months. So. What's exciting to me is there's a real opportunity in healthcare to make significant changes, particularly uh, we see a lot of things in robotics and in artificial intelligence, but even just in devices and therapeutics. So, you know, we're just really interested in, in transforming medicine and it's a good opportunity to do that. For me, you know, I, I've, spent a lot of the last 15 years looking at India and seeing how India has been transforming. And 
you know, over the last six years specifically, we've seen a major shift towards digital adoption, you know, through mobile phones. Uh, half a billion people uh, are on mobile phones on the internet now, and you're seeing more and more people getting online, payments becoming much easier. So India has been a really, really interesting and exciting opportunity um, for me, seeing the journey as an entrepreneur, as a community builder, and as an investor. Um, so that's one market that I'm really, really excited about. You, you have 1.3 billion people, almost 1.4, and all of these people are aspirational. They're coming online, and there's a long history of technology adoption and development in the country, right? And that going abroad uh, is really exciting. Like for the first time, you know, instead of hearing somebody pitch, oh, we're building the Uber for India, I'm hearing, oh, we're building the Kata book for New York uh, or Kata book for Southeast Asia, right? Like that to me is where you're seeing most places outside of uh, Western Europe and the United States can adopt technologies that are being built in India for a different demographic. So that, to me, that's really exciting. Yeah, really cool to see that, you know, um, being present in Latin America and emerging markets in general, it always is the other way around, but now seeing uh, happening, you know, okay, we want to build, you know, a um, new bank for X, whatever, you know, or we want to build something coming from the region uh, and develop markets. That's a really cool thing. So we are um, really being present in Latin America for the past, past couple of years. I'm really excited about LATAM as a region. It's uh, like 600 million people, it's like 5 trillion GDP. The smartphone penetration is really high and the pandemic really accelerated the digitalization of businesses as well as digital adoption. So that also translated into a lot of new VC coming, VC money, VC investment coming in. It was like last year was a record year, it was more like 4X than, than all the previous years, then 2020 as well. So one of the fastest growing regions in terms of the BC. And a lot of the capital that we see coming in, it's for late stages. So less than 1% is for pre-seed. So, and the number of pre-seed deals uh, in the region has largely stayed the same in the past three years. So that's where we see a big opportunity and a big need of really working with entrepreneurs, really seeing entrepreneurs that uh, have experience in growing businesses but maybe lack the structure, the help in really achieving that uh, growth. So that's where we, we really focus on. So, and also in terms of the sectors, we're really excited about FinTech. You now there's a lot about half of adults that are in the bank in, in the region. Uh, E-commerce has had a really, really accelerated growth, uh, mainly due to the pandemic as well. And a lot of habits are here to stay as well. Uh, health, as uh, already Orin mentioned, you know, there's a lot of things that changed for, for a lot of people, uh, especially in terms of adoption, how we serve them. And, and also, yeah, we see really great investors, international investors coming to the region that gives us more hope and support for growing their business and, and having follow-on capital as well. I just want to, you know, the pandemic is, is awful. Lots of people died. I lost lots of friends. But as far as technology, internet adoption, uh, venture capital, it's been, been really uh, an accelerant in so many sectors, in so many areas of the world. All right, two panelists mentioned it. Uh, Shiram and then Pavlos. Yeah, I would probably add something quick here uh, from a, you know, uh, focus standpoint, I'm really bullish about SaaS startups and, you know, for, for a good reason here, like we discussed, uh, but particularly, you know, my focus on Indian startups had, has, you know, shown me that, you know, uh, access to capital is very important, but access to markets is even more important. And so from that perspective, there's a huge market opportunity here in the U.S. 90% of the enterprise SaaS market is in the U.S. It's a $200 billion market plus by 2025. So that really excites me. I mean, when I hear stories about like how we want to actually develop great products, that's great. But how can you solve the market problem here in the US and how can you actually make sure you can have a successful market entry? That excites me more. And if I can add value there, you know, that's all the more exciting for me. And you're helping bring companies from places like India to the US. Right. Um, Pavlos? 
I, I totally screwed up and started answering questions in the Q&A, so I forgot what you guys were <laughs> You writing answers in the Q&A? I, I, I shouldn't. I know. I'm sorry. I did the yeah, wrong so thing. Yeah, so we were asking about what market is exciting you or what's getting, you know, what things are exciting you right well, now. Well, the actually one, so I'll tell you two things. So one, I think someone addressed, which is that money has moved from public markets into private markets. That's making venture huge. That is awesome. One effect of that is it's causing all these startups that should exit six, seven, eight, nine years in, they're doing C, D, E rounds, and they're going to year 9, 10, 11, 12. So venture runway, venture is extending on time, which is awesome for deep tech because sometimes our projects take longer. And that has been one of the big problems holding back deep tech, which is that you know people look at it, they say, oh, it's hardware. It's hard, says in the name. So, you know, they don't want to do it. They want easy software stuff. I call that shallow tech. So if you look at what's happening now, we have these macro trends that are really helping us go after, you know, these projects that might take a little bit longer. And we talk to our LPs about that because, you know, they need to know that, you know, all their venture investments are likely to take longer to exit. So, you know, the delta between doing software and doing what we're doing isn't as big as it used to be. So you, but you're so so. What is the time horizon on one of your things? And and while while you think of an answer on that, just for yeah. everybody uh, who's asking questions in the QA, we got great. I'm going to try and get through them now very quickly. So maybe one or two people ask questions that I pull. Do me a favor and upvote. There's a thumbs up. Click a thumbs up for questions you like right now, and so we can burn through lots of questions in the Q and A. But yeah, so what's your time horizon? Is it 15 years, 12 years? Uh, what are the, you the rule of thumb in venture was always 10, but because yeah, yeah. of because venture just overwhelmingly focused on SaaS, we ended up with these very quick turnaround kinds of companies. You know, your your Slacks and Zooms and things that really could get big fast, and so. The, so a lot of venture funds are looking for an exit in, the, in five to seven years. Well, you know, you could do that with software pretty reliably, but you're not going to do that with, you know, lasers, nuclear. Yeah, reactors. but how long, how long for you do you think? So we, so our fund is 10 years and then we have what, five one year extensions. And, and those, that just means so we 15. might extend up to 15. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we got lots of questions in the chat, lots and lots of upvoting going on. Thank you, everybody. Keep the questions coming in, keep the upvoting going in. So again, I'll ask these questions, raise your hand. I'll call on you maybe one or two people per question and we'll try and get through as many as possible. So I like this question from Dan. Uh, well, it's moving around here. How critical, if at all, is or was warehousing deals to attract LP investment for you guys? Who wants to take that? I do. <laughs> okay, That's well, you're in Cabo, so you uh, can go. I unmuted the passes. I look for us. Um, I didn't realize at first that it was going to be important. We had been warehousing deals. Um, we haven't even even now. I've really announced that we have a fund, but we have um, been able to attract a variety of, of deals that we're really excited about just because just of our network. And once we, started, once we started leading with those deals, when we talked to LPs, it really changed the conversation for us because we initially would come and say, yeah, we're doing deep tech. And if you don't know what that means, it just means stuff that's not software. And we'd kind of explain it. And that, you know, that was okay. It went okay, but we eventually switched our deck to where like the first slide is warehouse. Like we're doing this cool shit. And then from there, if you're still, if you, you know, you would get people excited about that. And then we can go into all the minutia of how the fund works and our backgrounds and all that stuff. But we start, we lead with deals now. And that's awesome. Um, that's and, awesome. Let's give Matt and then Pankaj and then we'll get to other questions. Great answer. Thank you. Yeah, I really agree with Pablos. You know, in the end, it's really if you're talking with investors and trying to get them excited, you know, you have to get them excited about you, about uh, the VC in general, your industry, the market. There's so many things, you know, and a lot of things are still not so clear. And if you really talk about certain deals that you're excited about, why you're excited about, how you met them, it gives so much more clarity to the investors that what you're actually going to be investing in, what you're looking at. 
they can compare them a little bit more what they see on, 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 with other funds as well. And it gives you like more validation that you are in this for real. It's not like, okay, we're gonna try this, we're gonna do this. It's really just something very concrete that you can show. And it's, it's very important for the LPs of not talking just about the ideas. It's really, okay, this is what we're doing. This is what we are excited and we're gonna do it. So better on, help along, join, join our fund. Pankaj? Yeah, no, I, I agree with everything that Matt and Pablo said. I think the difference here is that if you haven't been an investor in the past, you don't have a track record, you really don't have a thesis that you've built on, you need to warehouse deals. You need to be able to show that you can get access to those deals, and you need to be able to show that founders want to work with you. If you've been an investor in the past, then the track record really does help carry that, and you don't have to do as much warehousing. So that's it. Uh, by the way, I am loving this. I'm watching the chat. Everything's going great. So I appreciate every everything that and everyone's contribution. Okay. Um, there's a question here with a lot of at signs in the names. So I don't want to try it. And it's a tough name. So if your name is easier, I'll say it. For solo VCs, how did you address the key man hurdle with LPs? Uh, who wants a package? If you put your hand down, we'll give someone else a shot. Pablo, so let's give that one to you. Um, I, no, I, I, I think what they're referring to, um, if I understand the question correctly, is the, you know, in a in an LPA you have, or at a in any company actually you often have a key man, which means the investors are coming in because of this person. And if you we call it person, the key person, not the key man, but yes. Okay. Uh, yes. So it's been uh, updated to be politically correct. Yes. Um, one thing I know and. So you, I think the person asking this question might be thinking, well, you know, what LPs might be nervous if it's a solo GP. I'm t I, the reason I want to answer this is I have the opposite issue with, uh, with some LPs, which is that they prefer to invest in a solo GP. And the reason is, if you've ever had a partnership, you know, like a 50-50 partnership is literally like the worst type of uh, decision-making structure in the world, <laughs> right? And they fail the most and people have falling outs and you have no tiebreaker. It's like an autocratic dictatorship is the most efficient. Democracy is pretty down, far down as far as efficiency and 50-50 partnership is the worst. So that kind of thing is something you need to navigate. You really need to, um, you know, figure out how you're going to convey if you're not a solo GP. If you are a solo GP, then um, one of the reasons they're performing so well in venture overall is that they don't have to argue with anybody and they can be efficient and make fast decisions. So, Aaron is asking, how do you see the dynamic between the classic VC funds, uh, early stage funds, venture studios, et cetera? Are you seeing any trends here, right? So, I mean, I, 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 just to start, anyone can raise their hand on this one as well. Um, okay, sure, I'm, I'll give that to you. Let me, I'll throw something out in this regard. You know, we're definitely seeing a, and, and I, I forgot if it was, maybe Pablo's brought this up, but there's a massive shift of money that was in the public markets and this and that, moving into venture capital because it's the single best large asset class in terms of performance. For the last three years, it also is projected to be so for the next decade by many research organizations. All that money coming in, a lot of it's going to big funds, the Andreessen Horowitz, Sequoia, whatever, but a lot of it is also going to new entrants, new managers, emerging managers, et cetera. So there's a massive explosion of, of venture capitalists around the world. And then I'll pass it off to Shriram too, and then Oren. Yeah, I think uh, uh, thanks for bring bring this up. Like, uh, I, I think you know one of the things that's happening is uh, the nature of rounds are actually like shifting upstream. So, which means that now early stage funds you actually like are going to be participating more with other funds early on, right? So there's always room for more, and there's always room to collaborate. This always used to happen before. Now you know. Uh, seed has become pre-seed, right? And pre-seed, you know, an angel, you know, come, you know, has has actually shifted. So that gives a lot of opportunity for fund managers, including new fund managers. So you know, if you, if if the question is, hey, are you afraid that you know YC is actually opening up one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars and giving three seventy-five more? 
uh, I don't think it's a cost for worry. It just shows that there is market opportunity that they are coming after, which validates that there is market opportunity in early stage funds for you to focus on. Warren? So, so this, this is going to be a little nerdy, but I think you have to recognize the dollars at play. And when you have a billion dollar fund, you're not writing $500,000 checks. Like there's no economic benefit to that. So you're writing, you know, I don't know, $100 million checks. Um, so as an emerging manager who writes, you know, quarter of a million, million dollar checks, we're playing in a very different field. But what we are doing is we're creating an ecosystem that buoys the companies that then gets to those larger entities. So we don't compete with those large funds. In fact, they don't come in in our rounds and, and we have access in healthcare. They're afraid of those rounds because it costs too much money to invest in them. Yeah, I would say that I think there's definitely like this renaissance in early stage that's happening right now. Um, Dr. Hector is, uh, and sorry, I'm not, I don't want to mess up your last name, Girard, uh, is, is who are you looking to be your initial partners, friends and family, angel investors, family offices, etc. So I can tell you for most new managers, even emerging managers, so new managers are fund one, some research organizations also say it's fund two, uh, emerging managers are, you know, fund one, fund two, fund three, but leaning a little later, usually fund two and fund three. And then when you lead, get into fund four, you're out of the emerging manager bucket. A lot of LPs don't do new managers. Uh, so corporates are iffy. Sovereign wealth funds are mostly no. Um, endowments are generally no. Uh, pension funds are no. So your classic, like who invests in VC, actually don't invest in emerging managers and especially don't invest in new managers. So with that said, I'll pass the, what types of LPs are you talking to broadly speaking without getting specific? Who wants to, and Pablos, you're writing an answer. So we'll skip you on this. Who, who wants to take that? Uh, um, Pankaj, we'll give it to you okay. and maybe Matt, since you haven't gone, and then we'll we'll keep going with questions. Thank, keep those questions coming in and uploading. Pankaj? No, I, you know, I think the best place to start is friends, uh, co co-workers, people that you might have worked with in the past, uh, people that know you, people that you've built relationships with over time, because those are the people that are more likely to bet on you and give you some money to get started, right? So it, it, take a playbook out of uh, the entrepreneur playbook and say, hey, I'm going to go reach out to people that I know, people that um, have worked with me and trust me. So start start there. And then, you know, it comes back to them getting excited about what you're doing and introducing you to other people that they know. And they're implicitly vouching for you when they're making those introductions. So, you know, build that chain out early. Yeah, everyone you pitch, you need to ask, is there anyone else you think I should pitch? <laughs> Just like build that in, like burn it in your mind right now, Matt. Yeah, I really agree with Pankaj. You know, in the end, you, it's really similar to raising for a startup, you know, really go with the people that have high confidence on you. They're going to invest on you. Then really just friends and family at that point. And then really try to grow from there. And in general, individuals, high net worth individuals, sometimes, sometimes family offices, would be interested in, in emerging managers, but really getting with institutional investors, it's it's very hard because normally you don't even get, you don't fit with the track record. You have smaller ticket sizes that they generally write as well. So it's uh, really just going with individuals that are bullish either on you or in, on the asset class or on the region or on their industry, something that helps build trust as well. And going through connectors that help build that trust is, is always valuable. Uh, I'm going to save Krishna your question for last about VC Lab because I, it's going to make me blush and things. Uh, what, so um, what kind of profile should a VC manager have in terms of previous experience and track record to have the best chance of fundraising for his or her first fund? This is from Frederico. If you want to just raise your hand. Uh, you sort of already answered this, Pablo. Sorry to keep kicking it a little down the road. Anyone else want to take a shot at that? Um, I can probably just take a quick one there. Uh, 
I think you know you want to make sure you show that you are you understand the startup ecosystem because if you if you're not part of the ecosystem you don't understand it you know you don't understand the asset class at all right so from that perspective having some knowledge about a startup ecosystem is, is going to be uh, helpful uh, the, but the most important part is do you have relevant experience even in, in an adjacent space that you can bring to the table because if you don't have that then you won't be able to convince your LPs. so that's something that i want to add yeah. all right let's keep going oh you want to well let's keep going we got lots of questions so i'd rather just get more questions than more answers if you will um if you think about the team roles compensation cash and equity uh or how do you think about the team when you're launching and running a new fund. This is a good one. And, and Pablo, as you talked a little about teams, so why don't we give that one first to you. And Oren, you also have a team uh, and Matt does as well. So we'll start with Pablo and then raise your hand if you wanna add to it. Okay, Matt. Oh, um, I, I have one partner um, who is also a GP and we work together. Um, we have very complementary skill sets. That's helped a lot. Um, and I think that for us, it's a good setup. I think, like I said, I think solo GP can be more efficient in a lot of ways, but we have, a, a you know, we're building a bigger operation than some of the other folks. And, um, and for us, you know, our team, a lot of what we needed was backend support. And we get a lot of that from the VC lab folks. So, We've been able to kind of cheat at building a team by co-opting uh, VZ Lab, and then um, and then for the specialized uh, help for things like evaluating certain technologies, you know, we rely on our network for that. We do it on kind of a deal by deal basis. We didn't add venture partners to help with every deal the way a lot of funds do, but that's um, that's the choice that makes sense for us because we do such a wide variety of things. Let me double click on that. The, the big strategy for new uh, funds or new firms, both, is you bring on venture partners to fill, and they're compensated with carried interest, usually not salary, because new funds and new firms don't have a lot of money to pay people. But Matt, uh, your shot. Yeah, I really wanted to just double click on, on the team that is not permanent so on the venture partners so there's really a way that you can get more people excited other people that have either connections with investors know the space uh, that uh, you've worked with in the past that can help you in terms of getting in contact with investors sourcing the deals and something that is not let's say on your payroll it's more a cover collaboration on a success basis and i think it's really important that you with all of your team try to really double click on what will make this a success in the long term so and everybody can get a shot, shot at carry or shot at having a, a, a part of the upside if we all do our job great Oren, you also have a team so yeah also uh, two i'll just add two things because i totally endorse what what pablo's and matt was saying um the one thing is that i would say keep your team small in the beginning um, you just don't need a big team uh, right away and you should hire people as the needs for people come up rather than hiring people and hope needs will appear for them uh, in my opinion but but the other thing that we don't really talk about because this is sort of like dating right where you think you you look the nicest and everything's perfect and um, but being an adventure fund is a 10 year plus marriage and more importantly being an adventure fund is in my opinion a really important, like you have to have a, a, a meeting of the minds with respects to values. And it's very easy for people to go off the reservation and do things that you may feel are inappropriate. And it's much harder to deal with those things after the fact than it is to make sure you're working with someone whose values align with you. So I, I would really recommend getting to know someone understanding their values and their drivers and if you have a longer term relationship with them that's probably better and and just to underscore that when we take money from people to invest we're taking a lot of money and i think it's really in my mind in terms of values it's really critical to be 
a very judicious and appropriate steward of that money. We already have risk with respect to the investments. I don't think we should be introducing any more risk. So, I, you know, I just think that's really important in terms of building a team. I love that. And you'll be working with these people. You said 10 years. The reality is in many cases, it will be 16 years. I, I, I look at it as like, if someone's coming on a partner in your firm, you will be working with them for 16 years, right? It could be 10 years on the early side, or it could be less if it totally blows up, which is a disaster. But um, think about it like 16 years. I like this question from Diego to all the panelists. If you could to have the chance to start VC Lab program again, what would you do differently? I think that's like, you know, interesting. Who who would like, you know, how could you maximize your experience? Uh, okay, Pankaj, you want to take that? Yeah, I think, you know, you guys told us this uh, really early, but some of us didn't do it, which was talk to as many people as you can, right? Go through your whole network, start talking to your old colleagues, your friends, founders that you've met, you know, talk to everybody. Hey, I'm thinking about doing this. What do you think? That will help you kind of formulate your thesis faster. It will help you kind of right size your fund faster also, right? Like some of us uh, might be thinking, hey, this is a really good size of fun that I should do. But once you start talking to people might come back and say, well, maybe not, you know, maybe I should uh, resize this a little bit. So, you know, I think going out and talking to as many people as possible early on, don't be shy. Don't feel like, oh, people are going to think I'm crazy to do this. Just get out there and start talking. Start with the closest people first and then kind of expand outwards from there. Pablos? I think this, this is similar observation, but if you think like for people who've been a founder, you know, when I was a founder of a company and I was pitching VCs, um, looking back now that I'm a VC, I see like, oh shit, I did not know what I was doing because I didn't understand what the VC's business model was. I didn't understand their, you know, incentives and what I didn't, I mean, I'd read about VC, but I just did not have a real sense of what, what they were trying to accomplish and how it worked. Now, I know a lot more, and I'm sure if I was to, you know, pitch VCs, I'd be a lot better at it. The same is true if you're going after LPs. Try to understand where they're coming from, what they care about, the other things they're doing. You know, Oren talked a little bit before about how a lot of them, you know, you know, an LP is is playing a completely different game than you. They have a billion dollars to manage. They can't be thinking about 200k here and there. So they just have a completely different set of things that matter to them. And you want to learn about that and understand that. So when you're talking to them, you're offering them something that makes sense in the context of, of their worldview, not, not your imaginary one. Matt? Yeah, um, maybe just uh, the last one as well is just really try to use it as a network. Connect with other fellow co-managers, you know, really reach out to them. Uh, get uh, building relationships you know use the network to your advantage ask them for advice you will be able to share deals in the past you know ask them for insights they can open doors for you as well and and cut some learnings for you as well you're muted oh we're down at my microphone went off sorry about that uh we're down the last minute here there's a great question number one rated from krishna uh, and, and maybe we close on that. Before we close, though, please paste in the chat. There's LinkedIn for everybody here. Connect with them, okay? Connect with them on LinkedIn. These are amazing managers, uh, and hopefully you can all forge long-term relationships. So Krishna was asking, can each GP share a key benefit or benefits from their experience at VC Lab that helped them in their VC journey. And we'll go in order on this one. Oren, Pankaj, Maj, Shiram, and Pablos. Oren? So this is a really big question. And I think that I'll start by saying everyone who's thinking about putting together a VC fund who hasn't done this in the past should take this program or at least apply to it and hope they get in. Um, I think that it, it, it really organizes your thinking and it gives you the program 
the understanding of what, how to run a firm, right? I mean, we all want to run a firm. Oh, it's great. We'll have money. We'll find companies, right? And VC Lab isn't telling me how to look at a company and decide how to invest in it. VC Lab is telling me what my legal documents have to look like. How do I reach out to LPs? How do I, you know, perform the functions that a venture capitalist has to perform so that I could do those other things? So I think that's probably the most important thing. And remember that you don't know what you don't know if you haven't done it. And because VC Lab is comprehensive, it makes sure you checks every, check every box. And I think that's really critical. Thank you, Pankaj. Yeah, you know, I think Oren hit a lot of the points that I was going to bring up. But you know, having been a VC before and having done a lot of this in the past, um, I still think the VC Lab was invaluable for me. Part of it was because it focuses your energies on specific things in a very structured manner. And, you know, in addition to, to that, you kind of get into the weeds on the operational stuff, which a lot of people may not have been involved with, even if you were a VC in the past, right? So I think there's with that structure and also understanding the operational side is really critical to building a VC firm, not just a, a fund. Right. So uh, I tell everyone, like, if you're even thinking about it, it doesn't matter if you've been a VC, you got a couple of unicorns in your portfolio, it doesn't matter. If you want to start a VC firm, you should go through VC Lab. Yeah. Um, yeah, I really agree with uh, Orin and Pankaj. It's really about the structure, really what you have to think about, the priorities, the focus. And it's really intense as well. So it's really not uh, something that uh, <laughs> you could do as a part time, you know, really do it if you want to do a fund, you know, if you're thinking about it, maybe or whatever, probably you're not going to finish it because really it's not as didactic. It's just like you learn by doing, you have assignments, you have things to do, which is actually talking with, you know, with investors. It's talking, refining your thesis. It's really just pushing you forward. So in the end, it's also intense, but rewarding. So you can really move forward and, and, and save time on that. Yep. Um, I, I want to add that, uh, you know, this is a program where you do and you have the experience. You gain the experience in the four or five months that you're going to be through the program. That's more important. This is not like a typical learning experience that you have in a school or, or a program for training. This is a program where you do and you learn as you do. So that comes, you know, that gives you experience. So incredibly rewarding for me. And like I said, I probably, you know, wouldn't have been able to do this myself, uh, you know, uh, in any less time. The program really accelerated me closing on my fund and, and our direction for closing the fund. So incredibly thankful for that. Well, you do education and prof professorial work yes. as well. So at you... Stanford, at Santa Clara, so that's what I'm going behind me, but... Yeah, so you would know. All right, Pablo's last but not least. Yeah, I don't, I don't know why we have to sell this. It's a free program if you can get in. Um, and then it's, it pays off if you can keep from getting kicked out. Um, so I think it just, if, I, if anybody told me they wanted to get into VC or start a, start a new venture firm and they weren't trying to do VC Lab, I would, I would be very dubious and, and try to convince them that they're, they're being idiotic because like I, I wouldn't be this far without VC Lab and hopefully, I mean, we've said enough about it, but. Yeah, yeah. I, I love you guys. Yeah. Thank you so much. This was awesome. And yeah. here's what I'll say for everybody here again, connect with them on LinkedIn. This is their, their moment to shine. Their funds are, you know, in a great spot. They're awesome people. You should definitely try and meet them. And I know there's a lot of questions we didn't get to. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to talk with Mike, uh, who wor works with me on VC Lab, the accelerator component. We're going to do another event as soon as next week. We'll do it AMA only and try and get to everyone's unanswered questions. And thank you so much, everyone. This was amazing. Thank you. What a beautiful event. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, VC Lab. Thank you, Adele. Yeah, thanks for everything. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Bye, Good everyone. Good luck, everyone. Thanks, Bye. Bye.